Okay, so how did you go from knowing all of that, it being an antimicrobial, to actually using it as a therapeutic for human patients? Okay, that's a long, depressing, torturous road. <laughs> Not really. But in the beginning, when we had all that, how can you use it in the humans? Well, um, with the babies and the approved use of nitric oxide, we use like 20 parts per million or less. It's approved for 80, but 20 parts per million or less causes selective vasodilation, which is great. However, that's given continuously on a ventilator typically. And my first step was to be able to, what is the antimicrobial dose of nitric oxide that kills um, the cytotoxic to bacteria and inactivates viruses, prevents, you know, those kinds of things. So yeah. fungi, etc. So did the research, our team, we found out that, that lo and behold, the, the, the dose for nitric oxide that is antimicrobial was somewhere between, say, 120 and 250 parts per million. So we settled on, from a, from a safety perspective, doing toxicology, that 160 was safe. Well, that was for a respiratory therapist at the time and guy interested in pulmonary infections. That was really depressing. The reason why it was is because if you were to give 160 parts per million continuously, it would bind all of your hemoglobin, you get met hemoglobin, and your patient would asphyxiate, which would be very bad. It would like contribute to nitric oxide is a toxic gas. And in fact, that's why it was Which is what it was used as in the field when right. we were first starting all this. Right? So our first step, we found the dose. And so we, of course, went in and started looking at it as a topical anti-effective in, um, in wounds. And so that research went on by itself. But I still had a dogged um, desire to, to look at this as a, as a pulmonary uh, anti-effective agent. And so... <clears throat> I started looking at the metabolism of methemoglobin in the body and found out that the half-life was 60 minutes. So I started thinking, well, I came up with a hypothesis that if you were to give nitric oxide for, say, 30 minutes, your methemoglobin would go up to um, under 5%, which would be safe. And then if you stopped nitric oxide, didn't inhale it anymore, and you waited three or four hours, because of the half-life, it should go down to zero. So you could give nitric oxide for 30 minutes, wait four hours, give it again, so you could give this cyclic effect. But the problem was, if what happens if you take it off? Do the bacteria all multiply and you have no effect? So I was able, in the Petri dish with my team, show that indeed, if you give 160 parts per million for 30 minutes, every four hours, you could maintain this antimicrobial effect. And so that was the first step. So I published that, and of course, I got slayed in the literature. They said, this will never happen. So from, that was about 2004, 2005. Yeah. I, the next five to 10 years of my life was showing that it wasn't toxic to the cells. We did the animal model. And then finally, I think in 2010, during the Olympics, when everybody got out of the hospital, I had a space at UBC. We were able to do 10 patients, deliver nitric oxide to 160 and healthy patients, not even patients, healthy participant volunteers under the auspices of Health Canada and, and IRBF to say, make sure we say this, <laughs> that um, it was safe. There was no lung function uh, effects, bad effects. There was no methemoglobin. They could breathe it normally and there was no effect on them. So we had proved first in human, um, inhaled nitric oxide 160 seemed to be safe. Which was very exciting because I remember when that happened, I was in high school. So <laughs> it was an exciting you time. You sure it wasn't the Olympics? Yeah. <laughs> also an exciting time. Okay, so you did the human the safety the safety trial. You established that it was safe in healthy patients. And then after that I know you moved on to look at cystic fibrosis patients and that was the first time you had looked at patient populations that were not healthy. Um, can you just explain a little bit about that and what, what came of the results? Sure. Even though you, you publish and you show it was safe in, health, in healthy humans, the barrier was still there. The barrier that A, I went for a CIHR grant, I went for grants, they wouldn't give it to me. Um, I couldn't get any, anyone in Canada and for that matter, North America, to, to support in grants or fund my research, which was a little depressing. But 
as, uh, as fate would have it, Dr. Goering um, from, from Germany, who at the time was the um, president of the European Cystic Fibrosis Society. I had helped a group in Germany um, help a, a, a patient there with my a higher dose inhaled nitric oxide, 100 parts per million. He had seen that. And then he phoned me up and he said, Chris, I have money and I have a place. Why don't you come to Germany and we will do this study? And so it was in Tubinga and uh, Gerd invited me over. We did seven CF patients that were late stage, chronic, drug resistant, Pseudomonas, uh, they had the fungi Aspergillus, resuming E. coli, and we were able to publish and show that we indeed could significantly, like we're talking multi-log reduction um, of, of bacteria in those patients' lung. And so that really was the what changed things for people looking at safety and that this might actually work. So those were, those were exciting times. Mm -hmm. Gerd has since passed away, and uh, Gerd Doring, and uh, I'll remember him forever because he truly made it happen for us. Sorry. <laughs> so we, we've talked a lot about the inhaled uh, mm -hmm. delivery of, or the gaseous delivery of nitric oxide, but you have also been looking at the use, and others have been looking at the use of uh, delivering nitric oxide through a solution. Can you just quickly touch on what you're doing in that area? Sure. Um, so. Delivering nitric oxide from pressurized gas cylinders has its problems, not its problems, it's just um, if you want to use nitric oxide outside the hospital, then lugging these gaseous cylinders around is just, it's impractical. So I had this idea of, uh, in about 2007, I had a pause between when I left Pulmonox and before I went to UBC, I was right in there and I was thinking, gee, what if you could, what if you could make nitric oxide out of some liquid or something like that? So I found and I met an amazing biochemist from Israel. Her name was Gilly, or not was, is Gilly Regev. And together we worked, I hired her from, uh, uh, through a National Research Council grant. And I told her, let's figure out all the different ways you can make nitric oxide out of the compounds. And so together we were able to come up with a liquid, which we called for lack of a better term, nitric oxide releasing solution. And so since then, we have been able to make this platform nitric oxide releasing solution. And she's currently the CEO and uh, we're, I'm co-founder of Sanotize. No, get that? Sanitize? No. Sanotize for nitric oxide. Just yeah. a little plug there for the company. <laughs> um, anyway, so we're working on that. Okay. So yeah, that's great. I the reason that I wanted to touch on that. Well, actually, I was going to ask you what are some of the different oh. infectious processes or yeah. conditions that you're you're using. So basically, it's a liquid or a gel. So anything that has that you can put on your skin or anything. So we have a patent for using it for dermal and respiratory diseases mm -hmm. or infections. Mm -hmm. And so think about it. So we have uh, we're doing studies in acne, um, diabetic foot ulcers, athlete's foot onychomycosis, which is toenail fungus, um, chronic sinusitis, um, strep as a gargle. Um, influenza. Influenza as a nasal spray. Yeah. And so those are just some of the areas that we're working on right now. Yeah, right. So the reason that I was asking you about the topical delivery versus the inhaled uh, gaseous nitric oxide is because it's being evaluated currently as a therapeutic against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so I wanted you to explain, uh, at least for the study that you're leading with Dr. Regev, are you using inhaled nitric oxide or topical nitric oxide? So the answer to that is both. So at UBC, we, are, we were looking at nitric oxide to treat non-tuberculous mycobacteria and reducing the bacterial load in those drug, the drug resistant uh, bacteria. But when the COVID-19 came out, we decided that the logical shift, since we had antimicrobial or antiviral data for other viruses, that it would be logical to to amend that and get Health Canada approval, which we just got. And um, working with Malincroft, who's funding it, Malincroft Pharmaceuticals, and the press release came out. So um, we are looking at early stage COVID to as an antimicrobial or antimicrobial as an antiviral 
inhaled nitric oxide. So we're hoping to um, reduce the viral load before it multiplies and drops into the lungs and creates the, um, the ARDS-like response. So this is a high-dose antiviral. So that's what we're doing at University of British Columbia in conjunction with Novoteris and Malincroft. So on the other side, for the, the liquid, for sanitize, we're using a, um, a, a kit which has a gargle, um, a nasal spray, and in um, nasal pharyngeal ir um, irrigation. And so we're using that. And for that, that study that's in Health Canada should be approved fairly soon to start. We're looking at um, as, a, as a prophylactic. So we're looking at for healthcare workers that are in high risk areas where they might be exposed to COVID, looking at um, basically decontaminating their airways while they're working with these patients. Um, much like hand sanitize your hands, we're going to nose and nasal pharyngeal sanitize your airways to reduce the viral load. Mm -hmm. Now, the other groups that are working on it, um, Mass General and Harvard, they have three studies. One study is low-dose nitric oxide, which would be targeting COVID patients that have um, late-stage ARDS. So it would be correcting the VQ mismatch or improving oxygenation in intubated patients that have adult respiratory distress syndrome. So that's a low-dose study that they have going. The other, they have two other studies, which are fascinating. Um, and you can look these up at, uh, you know, on uh, clinicaltrials.gov. But their other two trials, one is high dose, 160 parts per million or that area. They're using a CPAP delivery device. And they're treating, again, much like us, the, um, the early, early to moderate stage um, COVID-19 infection. And then their other test, the other test is also prophylactic, and they're treating um, like respiratory therapists at the beginning of the shift and end of the shift. So I think together the body, we're all working in the same direction, mm -hmm. and so it's it's an exciting time. And I think nitric oxide as an antiviral is coming into its own, and we're certainly hoping that it can help in this situation. Definitely. And that's exactly why I wanted to bring you on my channel and talk about this today because. I mean, it's been exciting to work with you just because it's a family thing, but also this is really awesome stuff and very interesting uh, from a healthcare perspective. And so even for me as someone who is about to start a residency in OBGYN, so I'm not a, not a budding pulmonologist and it's still <laughs> interesting to me. Um, so thanks so much for coming on. Thanks everyone if you watched to the end. I hope this was very informative for you. Like he mentioned, if you are interested in looking up uh, more information, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov. I'll put uh, that link in the description box below if it's uh, on my YouTube channel. And you can search um, nitric oxide in conjunction with uh, Chris, Mil Chris Miller and um, COVID-19, coronavirus, or NTM, I think, uh, cystic fibrosis as well. Not to produce mycobacteria, cystic NTM, fibrosis. Yeah. Um, so you can do that if you're more interested. Also leave a comment if you have any questions or uh, shoot me a message if you're interested at all in learning more. Thanks again for watching today and I will see you guys in my next video. Thank you.